we told you in jury selection it was going to be three weeks, and it's now been two weeks, so we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, this is this is our time for our closing argument, and I'm going to spend some time going through the evidence, um, and I'm going to spend some time going through the elements of the crime. I want you to know that I have been watching you di diligently taking notes and listening. So what I'm not going to do is spend a lot of time repeating everything that was said from the witness stand because I know that you all listened and I also want you to know that I really appreciate that and I know the court does too. I told you during jury selection that it wasn't going to be easy and it was not easy. Listening and watching and thinking about four young kids being gunned down in their school is not easy. You listen to every witness, you examine the evidence, evidence, and I suspect that many of you feel the way that we do, that it's difficult. But we owe it to the victims and their families to say what really happened. And you've listened and you've done that. In our system of justice, we have different roles to play, and each role is different. There are people who think it's the prosecutor's job to convict people. I don't think that's the prosecutor's job. I think my job and, and our job is to present, present the evidence and the facts and tell you the truth. And telling the truth sometimes means showing you things none of us want to see, some of us don't agree with, some of us don't like. But I believe that that's my job. We don't pick or choose the very best things because I believe that you should have the truth. And I believe that it's not my job, nor is it right, to sanitize what happened in that school that day. Because if we don't tell you exactly what happened, then you don't know all the facts and you don't know what the truth is. My job here, our job, that I believe we have done, is to meet our burden to prove that Jennifer Crumbly is guilty of four counts of involuntary manslaughter. The burden is high. I told you that during jury selection but we embrace it. And I believe that we have met that burden. It means that you had to sit and listen to a lot of very emotional things, a lot of emotional people, people who sometimes aren't emotional, but we're emotional for this. Because what happened on that day, every single person in that building had never experienced anything like that in their entire lives. And I hope to God they never do again. So you did see a lot of people, including law enforcement, become overwhelmed with the emotion of it all. That's not a show. That's just how that was. That's how it felt that day and every day after. So I want you to know that there was no picking and choosing the very best evidence to give you. There was no filtering things out that didn't help our case. I showed you everything. And I called witnesses to the stand to say things I knew you probably wouldn't like. But I just, I, I, my job is to give you all the facts. But my job is also to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Jennifer Crumbly is guilty, and I believe we've done that. The defense also has an important job, to advocate and argue for their client. And they decide how they want to do that. And of course, the judge plays an important role. Her job is to call balls and strikes. When two sides disagree to make a ruling, and then to tell you what the law is. And she's going to do that as soon as we conclude here. And then there's your job. Your job is to decide what the truth is, what really happened, what are the facts. And then take those facts and find the, find the, the truth and apply the law. The judge is going to give you instructions about the law, but I want you to go over what you now what you now know, and I want you to think about it. And we're going to go over some of the evidence. But I also want to remind you that you're allowed to use your own observations, 
and your own insight. And if there's something that you notice from the witness stand that I didn't say, you, you, sh you should rely on that. We can't possibly tell you every single little thing. And sometimes, sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, the most important things are the things that don't get said. The most important things are the way the victim or the witness spoke, the way they answered a question. And I encourage you to rely on your own perceptions of that. I want to start out by talking to you about the elements of the crime. Involuntary manslaughter, she is charged with, this case is based on two theories. You're going to have all this in the jury room, but I'm, hopefully I'm going to explain it so well you will have no questions. Um, these are uh, dependent on, on two specific theories. One is the gross negligence in the performance of a lawful act, and that that gross negligence caused death, and in doing so, the act that caused death defendant acted in a grossly negligent manner. The second is the gross negligence in failing to perform a legal duty. One, I have to prove that there that she had a legal duty to, to the victims. Two, she knew of the facts that gave rise to the duty. Three, she willfully neglected or refused to perform that duty, and her failure to perform it was grossly negligent to human life. And then four, the death of the victims was directly caused by defendant's failure to perform this duty. Causation. The judge is going to instruct you, maybe more than once, and I'm going to say it, that there may be more than one cause of death. And it's not enough that the defendant's acts made it possible for the death to occur. In order to find the deaths of Madison Baldwin, Hannah St. Juliana and Justin Schilling were caused by the defendant, you must find beyond a reasonable doubt that the deaths were the natural or necessary result of the defendant's actions. You heard the evidence that the defendant's shot, son shot Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, Hannah, and Justin. And as previously noted, there may be more than one cause of death. And defendant's acts or inactions need not be the sole cause of the harm. In order to find that the death of Madison, Tate, Hannah, and Justin was caused by the defendant, you must also find beyond a reasonable doubt that her son's act of shooting some these four individuals was reasonably foreseeable. Now you look at that, all of that that I have to prove, and it seems a lot. It seems like it's going to take a pretty strong case to prove that. It's going to take some pretty egregious facts, some unique, egregious, uncomprehensible facts. And that's what we have here. Gross negligence means more than just careless. It means willful disregard the results to other, others that might follow from an act or failure to act. In order to find that the defendant was grossly negligent, you have to find the following three things. One, that she knew of the danger to another. She knew there was a situation that required her to take ordinary care to avoid injuring others. And second, that she could have avoided injuring another by using ordinary care. Third, that she failed to use ordinary care to prevent injury. And, a re and to a reasonable person, it would have been apparent that the result was likely to be serious injury. I told you there are two theories. They're both, they're, we're prosecuting and charging based on two theories. They're both based on a legal duty. What's a legal duty? In Michigan, a parent has a legal duty to exercise reasonable care to control their minor, tra minor child, to prevent that child from intentionally harming others or prevent that child from conducting themselves in a way that creates an unreasonable risk of bodily harm to others. We talked about there's two alternate theories. Either both of those theories, if proven, are sufficient to establish the crime of involuntary manslaughter. It's not necessary that you all agree on which theory has been proven. And as long as you all agree that, the, that we've proved at least one of those theories beyond a reasonable doubt, you can find her guilty. 